So I'm out here on this uh, rural Montana road to talk about infrared radiation. And I'm uh, capturing that with a uh, pair of thermal binoculars. This has been a, a very difficult shot to set up. Um, as cool as these thermal binoculars are and the technology behind it, it still has a lot of lackluster things. It's really cool looking through it, but the compression uh, inside of this uh, system is not ideal. It actually kind of ruins the image that you actually get to see while looking through it. Uh, it's not like this is like crazy high resolution. It's, uh, I think it's like 1280 by 720 or probably not even that. I think it's a little bit different of an aspect ratio. But what I want to talk about is actually this technology, which is pretty cool when you start thinking about it. Uh, the, so the sensor on the Sony a7S III that I'm using right now is a CMOS sensor. So it has little pixels on there with uh, red, green, and blue, and that's how it's producing an image. But with the thermal binoculars, they have micro bolometers in there. And so it's basically like a little piece of metal over a heat sensing pixel. And so that little piece of metal over there detects the temperature difference and then transmits that to these little tiny pixels. And so they're basically like micro machines, which is pretty insane when you think about it, that the, te that the technology actually works. Um, I gotta recalibrate this really quick. So that's the other thing that happens with these thermal sensors is that uh, they tend to overheat a little bit and it introduces a lot of noise. And so this one actually, you can set it to auto calibrate. I have it on manual so that I can choose when it actually freezes and clicks down the shutter and then recalibrates itself. This was very expensive. It was close to $8,000 I bought off of Amazon. Uh, I am not going to be keeping it because it's just not, it's not what I need for my use. And as cool as it is, I keep looking down at my phone so I can actually see if like what's going on in the shot. As cool as it is, it's just not the thing that I need for the type of experiments that I want to do. But still, it was very interesting seeing what this, this system could do and what it could capture and what it can't capture. I mean, I was super surprised to see that it can actually capture the moon. And I didn't think there'd be enough uh, infrared radiation coming off of their infrared, coming off of the moon for you to see it from, from that far away, but you can. And it was just, it was fascinating to see like what the limitations are on this uh, long wavelength technology that these binoculars are using. And so it's really cool and I've, I've enjoyed using them and it, it's a interesting way to kind of like play with kind of cutting edge technology. I mean, it's kind of cutting edge. Huh? I hear coyotes behind me. But it's interesting, it was interesting technology to play with and I really enjoyed, you know, using these and it would've been great if Pulsar would have sent me out these instead of me having to buy them and then later return them. Uh, but it is such a cool thing to use and to see like the wildlife around and like what, what these sensors can actually pick up on. Like it's really cool, like I have my glasses here but if I put these on, this actually reflects the infrared radiation, and so they look black in this view. I just had to recalibrate it, so I kind of re-talk over myself. But it's it's an interesting uh, a thing, like what the limitations are of this technology and what it can do. And this is this kind of loosely based off of like you know my channel of like what I do, like with radiation and stuff like that. So. I just heard something out here, sorry. I'm like out in the middle of a field right now. And it's like, I, I wish I had, <laughs> I wish I had uh, the thermals to look around uh, behind me and around me. Uh, but right now I'm too busy talking to them. It's like hard getting focus on this. Like I have to, I have to look at my screen here and try and get focus. And the minimum focus on these binoculars sucks. Like, it's really bad. I think I'm about, I want to say, maybe 15 feet away from 
the binoculars right now and I can't focus it any closer than that. So infrared is a longer wavelength than like gamma radiation or x-rays. And it sits on the electromagnetic spectrum, kind of uh, right before you get to visible light, which is that narrow window that we can see. And then up until x-rays, gamma rays, and all that stuff. Because that's like the super high energy wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what we're looking at right here is long wavelength. That's between like 8 and 12 microns that this um, sensor can actually pick up on, these microbolometers. But I did happen to get like a lot of footage, like uh, taking this out to fields and seeing like the wildlife that's around me. These deer stood no chance of hiding out in this field. You couldn't see them at all in the dark, but with these thermals, they showed up really well. That black hot setting looks really cool. Kind of gives more of a, like a realistic look as far as like uh, certain scenarios, but like the contrasts and stuff like that. It doesn't look like a negative image, but still I like the, the white is hot setting a little bit more and that's why I kept using it. This is a pretty cool view of Paradise Valley and you can see all of the cattle and also all of the wild animals moving through those pastures. The hills show up really nice too, as they're still kind of warm from the day. When you look through thermal binoculars, you start noticing that there are a lot more rodents than you thought there were. This is a little mouse at a rest area. What was interesting to see were these bats flying around a nearby lake. They would skim the water, picking the insects up off of the surface. Now, I've never seen this before, only in thermals. The fire that I'm putting my hands by was so hot that it actually made the microbolometers filming this stuck in a way. And so it kind of burned in an image into the binoculars. But it was only temporary. Once the microbolometers cooled down, it was fine. The water in the speaker was hotter than my skin temperature. And that's why it looks like it's glowing when I pour it on my hand. It was interesting to see the temperature of the water change from cold to hot to back again. One of my favorite things to do with these thermal binoculars was to look up into the sky. You would see lots of birds flying around at night, which was kind of bizarre. Along with some other unexplained phenomenon. It picks up a lot of like different stuff uh, or a different look during the daytime than it does at night. It's a, a very different type of like uh, a resolution because since everything's hot and giving off so much infrared radiation, you get like this kind of like weird kind of surreal look in the daytime. Whereas nighttime, it's uh, much different. And also the, the binoculars and a lot of these systems, they like kind of auto adjust based off of what the temperature is of a thing in the scene. So these thermal binoculars also had a bunch of different color palettes to choose from. I always like the white is hot or black is hot color palette, but also the marine and some of the other ones were kind of cool. Kind of reminded me of the Predator movies. I took these thermal binoculars to an outdoor public show in Big Sky. And it was interesting to see so many people show up on the thermals and what that looked like. Okay, so now the real question is, are radioactive items 
uh, detectable with thermal cameras? And the answer to that is so far no. <laughs> uh, this is a uranium glazed ceramic. And as you can hear from the Geiger counter, it's a little radioactive. Like right around 23,000 counts per minute, normal background radiation is around 36 counts, 35 counts per minute. And so the thermal camera, which is set up over here, uh, isn't able to see any type of additional heat reading or some type of weird anomaly, even with this being radioactive. I'm monitoring the, the thermal uh, binoculars from over on this side. And so this just looks cold. I mean, it just, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. If I grab it like this and allow my heat to be transferred, you should be able to see some of that on the ceramic. But it's interesting that this doesn't show up. It just shows up as being cold and it feels, feels cool to the touch. Now, the other thing I'm gonna bring in here is a, a, something a little bit higher activity to see if that shows up because, I mean, this is radioactive, but maybe it needs something more radioactive. I'm curious to see what happens because I haven't tried this out yet. Okay, so now this is one of the more radioactive things that I own. This is a radium smoke detector. So it has a very uh, radioactive source inside of it, uh, but it looks like from the thermal camera, it's, it's not showing up as anything particularly different about this. It has a little bit of, uh, Looks like a little bit of coloration. I mean, this has been out in the garage uh, for a couple hours. So I would think it might be a little bit warmer since the, eh, the temperature outside is 76. The temperature in here is 72. So uh, it shouldn't be too different, but I'm gonna open this thing up and see how different it is. And just to give you an idea of how radioactive it is. So I'm getting around 130, 150,000 counts per minute. Uh, that's without taking it apart. So we'll see what happens when I take it apart. So now I only have a glove on one hand because this is the hand that's going to be handling the source. I might as well have this whole thing open just in case the thermal camera picks up on something that I'm not going to see. I mean, that's the chamber right there. It's not showing up as anything hot or whatever. So I'm kind of curious to see what happens here. So this is the source inside of here. Now let's see if the thermal camera, the problem with this thermal camera is that I have to have this thing 18 feet away in order to get it to focus, which is a huge problem in testing this. So um, just had to calibrate it again just so the noise doesn't build up in the camera. Uh, but I'm not seeing anything inside of here, but maybe I need to take the source out just to, just to double check. Gotta get this guy out. Okay. I mean, I guess I should really have two gloves on. Yeah, maybe I should do that really quick. This source is ready to come out of here now. Now I got my other gloved hand here. Okay, so now this is the radium post out of the smoke detector. There's a couple more radium sources in here as well, but this is extremely radioactive. Uh, this isn't a source I like to handle for very long, but I'm curious to see if the thermal camera sees anything with this, because it looks like it doesn't. Let me just calibrate it again. And I'm looking here, I'm not seeing, it looks like there might be something going on here. There's definitely, oh, there is something going on. I'm gonna try and move this out of the shot here this as well, and then just put this down right here in the middle. Now, let's see here. 
see that's the problem with this. This is actually showing up to be like it's a little warmer than normal. To be honest, I mean, this is kind of surprising. So I have my gloves on and that's what it looks like against my gloves, but against this, this black mat that's right here, this source is actually showing up to be a, a little bit warmer than the surrounding container, which is right here. This is aluminum. This feels like aluminum as well. This is the exterior on the other half. And then this one also has some sources inside of it as well that are inside right here. But this post that's right here, it's gonna be hard to see in the thermal imaging because this camera has to be so far away in order to just focus on these items. That's my biggest like problem with using these thermal binoculars in some type of uh, scientific testing of to see if uh, you know micro bolometers can actually pick up on the radiation uh, from a very strong source like this, or if uh, there is a, some type of uh, difference in temperature because of how radioactive the source is. It kind of seems like it's able to, uh, to detect an uh, increased level in the heat coming off of this. It's very slight, but there definitely seems to be something going on here. Yeah, but radium is a, a very active source. And so this is, even this small little bit uh, is extremely radioactive. Now, as long as I'm just handling it for a short period of time, I'm not too concerned about it. If I was gonna wear this around my neck and <laughs> every day for years, I'd have some uh, problems. It'd probably actually create some skin lesions uh, if I was to wear this around for a prolonged period of time uh, in the spot that it was resting but just uh, making these short videos, I'm not too worried about it. So I'm gonna put this back together now because it, it doesn't need to be out. Um, it's interesting that, uh, yeah, I put this back together really cautiously, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, the thermal camera was, was fun to mess around with and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was like really cool to see it. The problem is with the thermal camera is that it's just, uh, for my use, it's not particularly good. Uh, like, as far as like capturing footage, because it has a lot of compression that goes into the footage uh, when it's being captured uh, inside of the binoculars. And I understand they're trying to maximize the storage that's inside of there. It's not really meant for like a, you know, in any type of scientific endeavor. Uh, so it's not the fault of, of the thermal binoculars, I mean, it's doing a great job. So looking through these thermal binoculars is great. The image is fantastic, but the recorded images kind of leave something to be desired. And there's a lot of video compression on there. Uh, also the resolution on this is only like, uh, you know, 1280 or um, like just below like the 720p mark of high definition. Uh, or right around there, it records like a square image and so I have to kind of chop off the, the top and the bottom, like where it has like the clip record length and then like the battery information and some other stuff that's on the top and the bottom because the, the image is actually square and it's not 16 by nine. And so it, it all makes sense for the use case, for what these binoculars are. And they do a great job, like they're fantastic. The image looks amazing. But uh, for this type of stuff, it's just not, it's not great. So hopefully you enjoyed uh, taking a look at some of this thermal footage. I figure it's kind of like in line with my uh, with my radioactive channel. Uh, you know, it's dealing with a form of radiation, just not ionizing radiation. But anyway, if you enjoy this uh, content and this look at this, uh, you know, these thermal binoculars, uh, leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.